Happy Mother's Day. I, I, um, uh, I don't generally do Mother's Day sermons, but happy Mother's Day anyway. And, and I expect that the mothers are going to be occupied with the families, and so don't expect... I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be occupied with Alice doing things for her. In fact, uh, one of the things that we like to do is just um, on Mother's Day go out and spend a ton of money. And so we're going to go do that. And so that's it, shopping trip and tooling around. So we're not going to be back tonight. And so we, church isn't going to happen unless somebody else wants to do it. Okay, uh, uh, I'm continuing uh, what we were talking about last week, and it's so important, that's one of the reasons, we're, I, it's going to sound very repetitious, because I talked about it last week, and I'm going to talk about it again this week. Uh, uh, after a person's baptized, you know, when a per, after a person comes out of the water, let's see, everybody, okay, the kid's gone, yeah, after a person comes out of the water, he dries off like Dustin, and puts on dry clothes, see, then what? See, salvation's done. You know, you go into the water, you come out, you're done. That's it. You're saved. You went outside of the kingdom, come back out in the kingdom, just like that. Okay, you begin by being saved, but it's still a beginning, a beginning of the Christian walk. So, you know, the righteousness of Christ has been credited to our account. We're all saved. You're really, now what? Now what? Well, now what do we do? See? And so... Uh, one aspect of discipleship is, of course, you fight against sin. Oh, all those things I used to do, I can't do anymore. Eh, I didn't, you know, I was getting tired of doing them anyway. Um, some of us have a harder fight than others. That, that happens. We were all different. You know, we're just people. And so some of us struggle more with sin than others do. I, and that just is the way it is. Um, uh, I, you know, I, you know, we, you know, uh, the, God is always on my case. You know, quit talking like that. Quit thinking those thoughts. You know, things like that. I mean, you know, that's just, that's me though. But I know, uh, yeah, you know, other people are just as pure as the snow. <laughs> well, that's, that's why you look to me, at least, when I'm looking out. Okay, see, but there's a positive aspect, a different aspect of discipleship that is beyond, has nothing to do with sinning or not sinning. That's, this is something else entirely. And now the lead into the great uh, uh, lead into the great commission is it's Matthew uh, twenty eight and eighteen where it says Jesus came and spake to them and spoke spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth go ye therefore okay now uh, that's what it said go ye because all power has been given to Jesus see now I wonder how, how do you give all power to a God who is already almighty, right? Okay, I mean, yeah, you know, Jesus is already God. That, that's our fundamental doctrine, you know, which we all believe. You know, whatever power exists anywhere has its ultimate source in Jesus anyway. If all power is his already, how can it be said that all power is given to him? What's going on here? When, how's this work? Okay, I mean, here's John. John 1, 1, right? Well, actually, it's 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. I mean, he's talking about Jesus. Uh, the same was in the beginning with God. Make sure we understand that. All things were made by him. Okay. Um, without him was not anything made that was made. This is lawyer speak, by the way. He, he, he qualifies it. Everything was not made by Jesus. God's not made by Jesus. You know, God isn't made by God either. God is, but everything else that's made is made by Jesus, is what John says. Okay, well, if God created, uh, you know, now in Genesis 1-1, the very first sentence in the Bible identifies the reason that we're all here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was it. Okay, just at well, if God created everything that was created in Genesis 1-1, Genesis and Jesus was the one who created everything that was created in John 1, 1, 1 through 3, then Jesus obviously is God. Okay, we shouldn't have to prove that, but we want to go through it step by step. So what's Jesus saying about all power being given to him when he has all power already? And we're, really, we know the answer. We already know the answer. Even as I'm posing the question, we understand the answer. See, 
uh, Jesus is God always, but Jesus became a man. He was God before, and then he became a man. Uh, Paul describes this in Philippians 2, 5 through 9. He says, let this mind be in you, uh, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the part we're getting at, the part we're, we're interested in. Who, being in the form of God, that means he's God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He's talking about a different person. You know, God the Father says I. God the Son also says I. God the Holy Spirit does the same thing. Okay, I. I, I but, he's talk, but he's the same in dignity and power and position. Okay. <clears throat> he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Uh, and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made, was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him, given him a name above all names, above every name. So Jesus is equal with God, which means he is God. He can't not be God. God can't not be God. The, the devil negative is intentional. He's for emphasis. He can't not be God. He is God. He always God. But he made himself. See, you see that in verse 7. And then he was made in the same verse. See, he made himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. See, there's a shift that happens here in this verse. A progression from God doing the making to the man, Jesus, being made. You see, you, you, you know, there's a, a progression that happens in this verse. Now, it's impossible that God could ever be, uh, that a man could ever become God. We're not going to be gods. <laughs> you know, that's not going to happen. I, you know, Mormonism notwithstanding, not going to happen. Okay, but it's not impossible for God to become a man. He can do that. He can do anything he wants. You know, so Paul states here that that's what God did. He made himself a man, and as a man, he was made. Okay, same person, different circumstances. Always God, but now man. Now, as a man, all things are possible for God that wasn't possible before. You know, God is always the I am. He can't not be. But as a man, he can be born. Uh, he was. As a man, then, he can get hungry. Couldn't before. He can get tired. He can, he can need sleep. He did all of that. But most importantly, as a man, he can bleed to death. He can die on the cross. Okay? And he can resurrect. And he did that too. Right? So now we have an almighty God who's also a man who by nature is perfectly sinless. He can't be otherwise anyway. This is nature. Who can suffer and die, and as a man, he can be he can be given all power in heaven and earth, even though as God he already possesses all power. Okay. Now there's something else that Jesus can do uh, that as a man that he can't do as God. See, as a man, he can be utterly dependent upon God. Okay. He can serve as our example of someone who is completely dependent on God. See, and that's what we're looking at. That's what we're that's where we're going with this right now. Dependency on God. Letting God do what God does best, and we doing what we do best. Okay? Now we're going to follow Christ from his baptism to his temptation in the wilderness. And this is in Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Jesus, see, when he was baptized, he went straight away up out of the water. Lo, the heavens were open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him in a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See? So now you have to keep the distinction between Jesus as God and Jesus as man always in your mind when you're reading these passages. As a man, Jesus can submit to baptism. As God... As a spirit before the incarnation, he couldn't be baptized, but now we see him submit, and the model is for us. We are baptized just like he was. Then Jesus sees heaven open, the spirit of God descending, lighting on him, and you know how we know what Jesus saw? Well, he spent three years with his disciples. I assume he told them. 
And so they recorded it. And so anyway, <clears throat> the uh, Spirit of God that descends upon Jesus, Jesus is God. It was his own spirit that came down, but Jesus is a man. And the Spirit of God came down and lit on him as a man. See, it's like those old 3D. Does anybody remember a 3D comic book? Yeah, it was hard to read if you didn't have those little glasses that went through. Ah, oh, you know, because they'd put the blue or the green and the blue and green or, or red and green, I guess it was. Maybe it was red and blue. I don't remember. But they outlined the whole deal was that when you put these glasses on, that everything stood out in 3D out of these comic books. They were never very popular. And, you know, uh, anyway, but if you tried to read one without the glasses, it was a squonky experience. See? Well, Jesus is like that. You have to read him. You've got to, to see him. In order to see him properly, you've got to see him through the lens of Scripture as both God and man. You know, red and green, you know, whatever. Okay. So, see, at any moment, the emphasis of Scripture, it, it might be on one aspect or another. In fact, in the first couple of verses of Hebrews, well, it just shifts back and forth, just like that. This is the way it is. You know, God, you know, Jesus is God, Jesus is man. Just, you know, very quickly. See, and so uh, whenever that happens, uh, see, we we have to we have to uh, you know we have to be prepared to go with the flow. We got to keep that in mind. You know, when Jesus says, oh, "I don't know the day or the hour," well, that's as a man. Of course, he doesn't. As God, he can't not know. You know, he's stuck with it. So there you are. You know, when you see that, you just, you know, you just realize what you're looking at. Okay. And so when he's being baptized, the emphasis is on his humanity. He's got a body. Uh, when the Spirit of God descends, the focus is on his humanity. And when he hears the voice of God proclaiming, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, the focus is still on his humanity. Okay. He's a human. As God, Jesus certainly knows what the Father thinks about. But as man, he can receive that affirmation of his sonship from the Father, right? And so in the, as a human then, the Son of God, in whom the Father is well pleased, as a, as a human servant of God, then he's led by the Spirit of God, right? He's led by the Spirit because as man, see, he don't always know where he's going. Instead, he just follows the leading of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, see, in Matthew 4, 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That was it. See, see here's the thing. Jesus, he didn't know the purpose, uh, nor the location where the Spirit was uh, being led to because he was being led, right? As a man, as wearing the form of a servant of God, as a worshiper of God, as man, Jesus was not in full control of everything. We view him like that, but he's not. He's a human being. Anyway, you know, he was led by the Spirit. And so Jesus, he gets up in the morning like every other human being. He washes his face, combs his hair. I assume, I mean, sure. You know, we all do that. Everybody everywhere does that. He chooses what sandals he's going to wear for the day. I, you know, he, he, he doesn't, but he didn't choose to go into the wilderness. You know what he did choose to do? He chose to follow the Spirit. That's what Jesus chose to do. That was his choice. So when the Spirit leads him to some place he doesn't know, he's following the Spirit. Because the Spirit did the leading, and it was Jesus who was utterly dependent upon that leading and chose to follow the leading. Now, that's the model for us, okay, for his disciples. See, that day was a day just like any other day for Jesus until the Spirit of God moved. All in, that was all in his humanity as people. We're human too, just like Jesus. He's our, he's our example. And we're his disciples. See, it's the same as for us as it was for him. It's the same thing. Same thing. So we get up in the morning. You know, we brush our teeth. We shower. Comb our hair. Say our prayers. We choose what to wear that day. You know. We attend our daily routine. You know, the, the things that we're no, we know we're supposed to be doing, right? Going to work, taking care of the home, all that stuff, see? And you know what we're doing all that time? We're waiting for the Spirit to move. We still have our work to do. We got to go roof, you know, <laughs> work on my deck. Thank you very much. 
you know, which they did, a billion. Uh, you have Jeremiah. Uh, you know, those are the things that we, that we do, the daily routine. We have to do those things. But all the time, in the background, is the Spirit. Waiting, we're waiting for Him to tell us where to go, when to go. Might be a while. We don't know. He's God. He moves like the wind. You know, He comes and He goes. Okay. So we wait for whatever opportunity to share the gospel that the Spirit's going to bring our way or what unexpected direction He's going to lead us. That's the ideal. That's what's supposed to happen. See, hey, you know, but to do that, we still have to have some idea, some understanding. Some understanding of what our responsibility is as human beings and what is the responsibility of God. They're not the same. They're not the same. We do some things. God has to do the other stuff. Okay? So, not our responsibility to lead ourselves. God does that. It's not our responsibility to convert anyone. We can't anyway. I, you know, converting someone always requires a movement in the Spirit. God does that work too because we just can't. We can't do that. We can't convert anybody. I can't. You know, we've tried that in the past. You know, conversion by sword. You know, you don't. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. See, our responsibility lies in getting up in the morning, doing the daily routine that God has given us to do, and while we're doing that daily routine, preparing ourselves for God to interrupt that routine at any time, to expect Him to interrupt that routine at any time to look to look for him to change our 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 expected daily path from what we expect to what only he knows okay now, to lead us to a place or circumstances we know not where that can happen and we should expect that and that happens frequently or sometimes or seldom our responsibility lies in the area of listening for waiting for expecting, looking for the call of the Spirit. So now, time for a little bit of a review. Okay, We're not evangelists. Talked about that last week. We're just, you know, we don't have that talent. We're not, you know, we're not. It, everyone's responsible. It's still, even if we're not evangelists, though, it's everybody's responsibility to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. We talked about that last week. Okay. Talked about sharing the reason for our hope with someone. It's not the same thing as preaching at them. That's a whole different thing. Preaching is the responsibility of the guy that God's appointed to do the preaching. You know, he doesn't appoint everybody to do that. Just some. But what Christians tend to do, and it, it's human thing to do, is that af after having shared the gospel with someone, shared our reasons for being a Christian with someone, that if they don't respond, we, we think that somehow we failed God. That, that sense of having failed. You know what that, that reveals? It reveals that we're trying to do something that only God can do. We can't convert anybody. We're trying to convert someone to Christ. It reveals something else, too. It reveals that unlike the one we're discipled to, that's Jesus, Unlike Jesus, we don't see ourselves as being completely dependent on God. That is, we're trying to do his job. <laughs> that, that's what that reveals. When we have that sense, of, oh, I failed. Man, you're trying to do God's job. God does job, God's job. We do ours. You already did yours. You shared the reasons why you're a Christian. You've done it. Okay, it's finished. Okay. <clears throat> So we're taking the responsibility for that which only God can be responsible for, and so it bothers us. But Jesus is our example. He did live in complete dependence. He didn't always exercise his own power, his own will, but he always depended on the Father's power and did the Father's will. Now, as an aside, I'm not talking salvation. You know, uh, that 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 was that was done done with when when you came up out of the water. That that's not the question. That's not what we're talking about. Say, I'm just talking about discipleship now. You know. But if anybody thinks, just because I'm talking about this, so you could get that impression too. I'm lecturing you about discipleship. Well, do you think I'm actually doing it? 
<laughs> you'd be wrong. I, I stumble like everybody else. I've messed up too, you know, and I, I forget. Oh, yeah, I missed an opportunity, Lord. I should have been more alert. That happens to me. That's, that's the same. It's just I'm just talking about what we're supposed to be doing and not what we actually <laughs> sometimes don't do. You know, we're supposed to, but we don't, okay? You know, I, I have an idea. I have a, a glimpse of what, what it would be like to be totally liberated, uh, liberated by being dependent on God, but I still stumble and neglect to forget and miss the mark. You know, it's the same for me as it is for everybody, okay? Now, I remind myself right now, I'm preaching to me too, uh, you know, as I stand here just as much as I'm reminding everybody who's listening, okay? We're in this together. All right, we're just as imperfect as any other human being. And I, I, I'm just pointing out what the scriptures have to say about it. See, and that's the idea that day by day we kind of stumble along, but we're stumbling along towards an idea, towards a way of living, which is what, which is, you know, which Christ is the example. And the size of our congregation, for instance, is uh, uh, up to God. See, the ideal is to be is to learn to be dependent upon God just like Jesus was dependent on God. And that is, part of it is, don't try to take responsibility for what we can't do. You know, God does that. See, and so, you know, so that means the size, you know, how many people we have here, that, that's not up to us. We don't get to say. God does. It's his church, okay? You know, uh, bringing opportunity to share Christ and opening doors and, and uh, uh, you know, ordering our day moment by moment, th that belongs to God, too. That's his purview. And we should expect him to do the work that only he can do. We should look for that. Okay. And we should prepare to do ours. Okay. Uh, when the Spirit begins to lead Jesus, Jesus was ready to be led. And it should be the same for us. A lot of times it's not. But it should be. That's what we're looking for. But if we, if we think that we have to do all our own leading and opening the doors, all our own opening the doors and all that, we're going to be disappointed. That's not going to work because that's God's work. More than that, see, if we think that somehow we've converted somebody, suppose, you know, I, I talk to someone and then the Spirit of God moves and he, hey, you know, I baptize him and then suddenly I got my chest sticking out. I converted somebody. <laughs> you know, that's... that's the prideful too, you know. I just took credit for God's work. What is that? You know, in, in discipleship, there is no room for pride. We're just following Christ, following the leading of the Spirit. You know, we can't do that. And so, it means uh, we 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 thank Him. We thank God for every opportunity, and we thank Him for every success because He's the one that brought us there. And we're only the branches. Jesus is the vine. No matter how successful we may be or not, it's all a gift from God. You know, pride of accomplishment has no no place in discipleship. You can't do that. Also means we have to stay alert. Spirit could call us to share at any moment. Expect him to use us. Uh, expect him to call us. Be ready to answer. Um, but go to work tomorrow anyway. You still have to do that. Got a job. You have a job. Go do your job. And then when the spirit calls, then we will do that. But you still have to go to work. Still got to get up. Nothing happens by accident. That's another thing to keep in mind. When you're standing in the checkout line, you know, you're not behind a particular person by accident. You didn't get that checker by accident. The person standing behind you is not there by accident either. There aren't any accidents. There are no happenstances, you know, with God. Uh, there's a purpose in everything. Don't know what it is, you know. Um, and the, you know the person behind you in that line, he's he's not there by accident. You're, you're not called to speak to either of these people, but sometimes they'll turn around and just ask you. I've had that happen, and I missed the opportunity. Okay, I feel really bad. I have, it's just one of those things. I'm sorry. You know, I that happened years ago, but it still bothers me a lot. Now, you might be shopping in the aisle. That's what happened to me. Or, or you're getting gas, you know. Always keeping in mind that nothing is accidental out there. You know, but by expecting to be called, see, we, if we expect to be called, we stay alert to be called. You see what I mean? We stay aware, okay? And if he doesn't call you at that time, you still have to occupy yourself with your job and your home keeping and whatever it is that we do that we're supposed to do. 
And after we do share our faith, we expect God to bring a response. You know, and we pray, should pray for that response too. Lord, I just got a chance to talk to somebody. I pray that you would make the, the seed of the word grow into glory for Christ. Okay. And surely he'll answer in due time if we don't give up. That's Galatians 6 and 9. So here's the takeaway then. We're not in this by ourselves. Okay. And his, and his humanity, Jesus didn't do it all by himself. It's the same for us. He's the example. We are alert to the opportunities, should be alert to the opportunities that God gives. We should take advantage of them with the talents that God has given us. You can't take advantage of opportunities with my talent, and I can't take advantage of my opportunities with your talent. Just what we have is what we offer. Okay. Uh, and then we wait on God. Paul preaches, Apollos waters. God's the one that gives the increase. Now we care about our relatives. It matters, it, it, you know, whether they're saved or not. And so we talk to them as they allow. Well, we care about our neighbors too, and we talk to them as circumstances allow. That's our part. That's what we're called to do. But, but nobody comes to Christ except they're called, and that's God's part. So we wait for the Spirit to move those we talk to, we wait for the Spirit to nudge us in a different direction as he pleases. Uh, we keep on looking for other opportunities. We carry that, that, that light burden uh, that Christ has given us to carry. And the heavy one, the heaviest of all, we let God carry. Okay, and that is, uh, he's, got, he's the one who convicts sin, uh, men of sin. And then he saves them. That is the hard one. And that's the one that God's taken on himself. We don't carry that one. And so now we can do this. We can do this. It's not heavy, not hard. We just got to keep in mind, keep our, our eyes open. And so it's time for the invitation now. <sighs> now, it's not fair to think that I'm 10 minutes late because we started late. Okay, so I just took my allotted time here. So I don't want to hear about it. Okay, all right. And so anyway, the invitation then is this time to the God that we depend on. Yes, so in the invitation, we're all baptized here, I think. And so this I guess the, the invitation is really for us to take our place as dependence upon God. Indeed, or Vinny.